Uh, I've had a slightly uh, circuitous journey from uh, when, when I, uh, I'll start back in uh, 1980 when I was a, a first year undergraduate at uh, University of Melbourne and uh, I was doing computer science. I was doing science and law and, uh, and in computer science the only thing that fit with my schedule was computer science. Sorry, in, in, in the science uh, uh, arena the only thing that fitted was computer science. So I started off in computer science and absolutely, absolutely hated it. Uh, there were 500 people in the class and only one computer, which was fed by cards that you, you put in there. Uh, you make one tiny syntactic error and, you know, it's another 12 hours until you can get another go at the computer. Um, it was a cold, bare lecture theatre with hard wooden seats. It was chalked down, down. It was awful. The whole thing was just terrible. Uh, but... Nevertheless, uh, learning Pascal in that very early, uh, um, that, that first class, actually kind of set a seed in my mind that I've, has been useful to me. It actually shaped my thinking e ever since. And in fact, ever since, one way or another, I've been involved at the intersection between computers and thinking. And that's included, of course, uh, uh, not of course, but, uh, but you may know from the description, <coughs> Uh, that um, it's included being the founder and CEO of a software startup. A software startup that was focused on thinking. So you can see the, how that intersection uh, goes. So, so just very briefly, uh, undergraduate at Melbourne University, finished my degree in philosophy, went to the United States, went to Pittsburgh, as some of you may know is a high-tech centre. Uh, went to Pittsburgh for my PhD, uh, five years there. Another four years at Indiana University, came back here to Canberra and then to Melbourne on a uh, Australian Research Council fellowship. By that time I was getting bored of being a regular academic and uh, I essentially decided to do what's pretty much unthinkable for most sort of career academics and I just sort of quit basically, I left and went and, and started my own little consulting business in critical thinking and that's Austin Consulting, still going today. Uh, and while at Austin Consulting, we created a sister company, uh, Austin Software, to develop uh, software tools for the visualization of um, reasoning, argument, decision making. Okay, and, and we successfully uh, uh, developed some tools, not so successfully sold those tools, uh, and that's of course the crucial <laughs> thing for survival of a startup, but anyway. Uh, so I'm really going to aim, you know, focus, I'm going to imagine that you are now, or you will be soon, the CEO of a startup company. And that's who I'm talking to, okay? Uh, if, if you are engaged in the early stages of a company, or in early stages of a, uh, uh, some kind of project, a technology project that may lead to, uh, to, a, to a company, um, you know, the early days of any, any project are all, all exciting. You know, that it's, the world is full of possibility and you've got a great thing that you're working on and you're so interested in it. Uh, and when you look at the future, it tends to be kind of bright picture of the future. Uh, you imagine what, what a great time you're going to have, you know, developing these great products and making all this money and traveling the world and, uh, you know, it's very optimistic. Uh, you can probably see what's, gonna, what's coming. I, I'm going to spend the first part of this talk actually presenting, the, to some degree, the other side of the story. I, mean, I experienced that, that early you know, uh, sense of optimism and excitement. Um, you, know, you wouldn't get into it if you didn't. Uh, you wouldn't start a company, uh, a startup. Uh, but then, you know, after a few years, um, the reality you know, uh, was, wasn't quite what, what I was uh, uh, anticipating. And, and that's partly because, as you can imagine, um, there's a big difference between being a CEO, being a manager, even of a small company. At the peak, we had about 20, 25 people. So, you know, it's pretty, pretty small, but, but it's enough to give you a lot of headaches, uh, big enough uh, for headaches. So uh, there's a big difference between what it's like to manage an, an entity like that 
versus what it's like to be the, um, you know, the, the, the technology sort of g person who has really interesting ideas and ambitions, okay, uh, and is used to working on uh, really interesting challenges uh, of a substantive kind. So, first point I want to make is, you know, founders, more particularly CEOs, make a lot of decisions. You, you probably have sort of no real idea as yet just how many decisions you have to make. There are all sorts of decisions. Now you, you would be familiar in the early days with you know, technology decisions and, and product decisions like you know, should we include that feature or not or how do we, you know, what's the best way to uh, improve the performance, you know, that's, those, those sorts of decisions. Um, strategic decisions about um, you know, how, should, how should you do this, should you actually sell your IP to you know, license it to another company, should you start a company, should you, um, how would you position this in the market as against competitors and, and you know, those kinds of strategy decisions. Uh, marketing decisions, right, once you get to that point you're going to have a lot of decisions around how do you take this product to the world. Um, there's uh, budgeting decisions, now we're, we're getting into the more, really into the managerial stuff, right, you've got a certain amount of money to spend, uh, how do you spend it. Uh, Legal decisions, decisions you're going to have to make, you know, uh, another company uh, is claiming that you're infringing their, uh, their uh, copyright or something like that, what do you do? You know, that's a quasi-legal decision. Now we get the really boring end, the HR decisions, you know, decisions like should we have an official set of company policies and procedures and if so, where do we get them from and those ones there, are they good enough? Right, I can't tell you how boring that stuff is, but you have to make these decisions. Right? And they're on top of all the other decisions you've got to make. Oh, accommodation decisions and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It just goes on and on. I skipped over a very important category, hiring and firing. This is something you have to do a lot of. Hiring, of course, but then, you know, uh, even if you're going quite well, you're still, got, you're still going to have to do firing decisions and those are some of the most unpleasant decisions you have to, you have to make. Now, Lots and lots of decisions. And individually and collectively, this is hard. It's hard to do. I once wrote a blog post, something along the lines of why CEOs deserve what they get paid. And uh, not that I was getting paid that much, uh, you know, as a, as a, as a startup uh, CEO, but uh, I now take it back because now it's clear CEOs get paid totally ridiculous amounts. Uh, I don't think they deserve what they get paid. But nevertheless, um, being a CEO is not all glamour and, and you know, power uh, and fame and so forth. It is um, a lot of hard mental work. And <coughs> why is it so hard? Well, here are some of the reasons, apart from the fact that there's lots of them. First off, in almost all these cases, all the decisions I listed before, you are operating outside the area of your expertise. Right, who, who has expertise in hiring decisions? Anybody? No. In this whole room, not a single person, right? It has, is an expert in hiring decisions. Actually, it's questionable whether this is a field of expertise anyway, but setting that aside, um, you get what I mean. You know, uh, budgeting. Well, some of you may have some kind of accounting or, you know, managerial background, but I'll bet most of you have no experience in budgeting for a company. Uh, you know, for example, I could go on and on, but the point is that almost all the decisions you make, many of which are very important for the success of your company, are decisions you have to make, basically, without being an expert in that area. I never, you know, I never imagined that, but it's true. You're constantly floundering in a state of uh, lack of expertise and lack and ignorance of what's really going on. Secondly, it gets even worse. Many of your decisions are made in relation to some uh, other party. So a classic example is uh, if in early stages of a, of a startup you may be um, getting investment, angel investors or venture capital investment, right? Now when you go into those discussions and you try to make a decision about what terms and conditions are acceptable, what, what is an equity, you know, fair equity share and so forth, um, 
you're at a, at a, it's not just that you're a novice, it's that you're a, a novice up against experts. Right? These people know this domain far, far better than you do. They have much more expertise and experience than you do. Right? It, it is really an unfair uh, situation to be in, uh, but that's the reality. Okay? Your information, expertise, disadvantage often. Take another example in hiring decisions. The person you're, you may be hiring knows a lot more about themselves than you do. Right? This is, the, this is the, the asymmetry, the disadvantage. You're trying to glean as quickly as you can as much as you need to know about this person. Are they going to be good at their job? Are they going to be a reliable employee and so forth? And all this stuff, you know, there, there's a massive amount they're not telling you. Because that's what employee, you know, people applying for jobs do. Right? They tell you only the stuff they, that they want you to hear. So you try and find out from other people and so forth, but this is time consuming and so forth. So information um, disadvantage. Now, related point, very often you actually have very little information on which to make decisions. You might say, how can that be in, the, in, you know, in this day and age when, when there's a vast sort of amount of information on the internet and so forth? Well, yeah, there is, but you know, overwhelmingly all the information out, out there is, is not relevant to you. And if you had to go out and decide, you know, uh, look at all, all the possibly relevant information and decide that, well, actually it's not relevant, it turns out in the time frame that you've got, the information that you've got very often is very poor, very slender. Okay? So uh, that's another problem. Closely related is great uncertainties. Even if you had heaps of information, there's still, still uncertainties about what's going to happen in the future, for example. Time pressure, right? You've got to get this thing happening. Uh, you've only got a limited runway time frame before, uh, before your first round funding runs out and you have to get runs on the board before that happens. You have to get a whole lot of things happening, a lot of decisions made. Time pressure, there's stress because you know that many of these decisions are important, very important to the success of your enterprise. Okay, so this puts the pressure on you as well as the time pressure. And last but not least, we are all subject to lots and lots of different kinds of cognitive biases. You've probably heard about this stuff. Uh, and you know, unavoidably, you will be subject to cognitive biases. Classic one is what they call optimism bias, right? When you estimate how much time it will take to, to complete some, some task, some project, you know, we're, we're terrible at doing that and uh, we, you know, almost always underestimate just what the complications are going to be uh, and how long it's going to take, okay? Optimism bias. You know, this old rule about, you know, if you're going to travel in Europe, how much money sh should you take? Well, you should do a very, very careful estimate, taking into account accommodation, everything you could possibly spend money on uh, and tally it up and come up with a budget and you probably heard it, right? And then double it. Right, because there's all the stuff that you haven't thought of, right? And, and uh, no matter how much time you sort of, how much effort you put in, uh, you know, you've, you've missed a whole lot of stuff. Well, it's the same with, with estimation of, um, of the work or time that something's going to take. Uh, it's very hard to do well. Okay, so, so cognitive biases are rampant. Okay. So in light of all this, you know, I found this picture on the internet and I thought, yes, that's it. That's the experience. That's what it's like as being the CEO of, of, a, of, a, of a startup company. Okay? That's the reality. That's what you feel like. You know. And coming out of all this, there's, I'll, I'll mention one more problem. I don't, I don't want to paint too gloomy a picture, but, but uh, one more problem is uh, something that, again, kind of surprised me, but there it was. Um, it's this notion of decision fatigue. Decision fatigue is the mental tiredness that comes from making decisions. That is, making decisions is itself a mentally taxing activity. It will tire you out. And when you get tired, when you get this specific kind of tiredness, it starts affecting how you make decisions. So to illustrate that, this graph here is from a recent paper uh, where they were studying parole 
decision makers. That is, you know, somebody uh, comes up for consideration, should they get out of prison or not, they go before a parole board and the board considers their case, makes a judgment as to whether they're, it's safe to, uh, to allow them to go out on parole. And uh, so, so it's parole board decision making and the, the x-axis is time of day. Okay. And the y-axis is the percentage of people who get out on parole at that time of day. So you can see it starts out very, this is, it starts out very, you know, you've got a very good chance. First thing in the morning, 60 to 70 percent of people are getting parole. By morning tea, it's plummeted. Almost nobody's getting out. <coughs> you have a cup of tea and a biscuit, and suddenly 60 to 70 percent of, of people are getting out. It's that dramatic. That is how much fatigue can affect your decision making, unbeknownst to you. I mean, you, you can know that you feel tired, but what you don't know is how it's affecting for your risk aversion, for example. Right? So, you know, look, if, if you take nothing else away from this, I would say this. You know, don't make decisions at the end of the day. Don't even make the, 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 them at the end of a meeting. Make them at the start of the meeting, preferably first thing in the morning. Right. when you're as mentally fresh as possible, if you want to make the, the, the best decision. Okay, there's just one little suggestion, right, that can help make better decisions. You know, I, got, I used to get so decision fatigued that uh, I'd, I'd, I'd get home and, and my wife would, would ask, me, ask me just the most simple little question. She'd being very, she would say, oh, wh what would you like to, you know, to drink with dinner? i go, oh. I don't care. I don't, I don't know. I don't, just don't ask me. Right? Because I was so fatigued right? uh, from making decisions. I didn't want to make any more decisions. Right. Now, on top of all that, worth mentioning some of the other constraints on you as a, decision, as a CEO of a startup. When you're making decisions, um, yeah, to a, to, to a considerable degree, you, know, you are the decider. Right? It's your job to make decisions. In fact, that is your main job. That is, that is your most important role. Um, but you can't just ignore what other people think, right? You, sh you need to involve your team. Uh, you need to bring your team in, get them uh, uh, contrib contributing, get their, um, get their, uh, you know, um, their involvement in the decision so that when a decision is made, they feel like uh, that it, that was, they had a chance to influence it, that, it, that they could see that, it's, that even if they don't necessarily agree with it, that they see why it was made the way it was, and so you've got more engagement, you've got more buy-in. You need to get buy-in. You know, it's a cliche, but you need <laughs> buy-in from your team, because if you don't have that, well, <laughs> you know, you're, it's not going to function very well at all. In fact, you know, uh, I'm not going to go into the whole question of what is a good decision. What is, you, you all have a rough sense of that. Uh, some people claim, I will say this much, that some people claim that it doesn't matter which path you go down as long as you've got buy-in. Right? That is the most important thing. That if you've got your team behind you, that uh, given all the uncertainties and so <coughs> forth, that having the team behind you, you can find a way, you can make it work. Whereas if you have a, you, you can make the most rationally brilliant decision uh, and, and if people are indifferent or even you know, passively hostile to it, um, you know, you really are... <laughs> You really are stuffed, right? Okay, so you've got to get buy-in. Your decision must be defensible. It's no good to have a, to have a brilliant idea and make a brilliant decision if you can't uh, explain to others, help them un to understand why it is the right thing to do. And this is particularly with ref reference to, for the biggest decisions, to the board. You will be responsible to a board. That's part of the stress. Is uh, you know a monthly meeting where you go in front of the board and tell them how you're spending all the money that they invested in, in your company. And uh, you know there will be times when they say uh, you're going to do what? And if it is you know a bold decision, you have to be able to convincingly defend that decision, right? Uh, so you, so how do you how do you do that? Well, you need you need understanding of your decision and you need some form of 
of adequate documentation so you can actually present the thinking behind a decision. Okay. So, so there are some of the other things you've got to bear in mind. Now, so in light of all that, what do you do? How do you be a better decision maker? Well, this is a very big topic. Uh, I've got a, a wall of books in, 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 my, uh, in my office and I'd say about 50% of them, one way or another, are about decision making. It's a, there's a huge literature on this and there's all sorts of different perspectives on how you should you know, go about making decisions. If, if you said, oh look, I, I, better, I better sort of study up on this, I better read up on it, well, you know, you know good luck because uh, that is a long road to, road to go down and, and you've got, you're busy with other things and you're, you might et find one thing that you think, oh, yeah, that's really good, uh, but then you're not, not realising that it is a partial and idi perhaps even idiosyncratic perspective on how to make decisions. Okay. Uh, I'll just list this. Here are some just rules of thumb and I just came up with this today. Right? Decision makers' virtues. Here are the, some of the things you should be as a decision maker. I'll just go ver through these very quickly because you'll barely even remember them, let alone absorb them and use them. You should be evidence-based, right? Make decisions, make important decisions based on all the information you can get. Be consultative. That's, you know, the buy-in, the engage your, uh, your, your, your team. Be cool. You know, you know this. Never, tr never make a decision in a, in a heated you know, in an emotionally charged state of mind, right? Always put it off, come back, sleep on it, come back later, uh, and, uh, and in particular never decide to send a, an angry email. You know, you know that. <laughs> uh, be cool. Um, be bias aware. Even if you're cool, you still need to understand your cognitive biases and try to factor those into your decision making. Again, I won't go through that. There's lots of good books out there on cognitive biases. Uh, if you haven't read it, seen it, um, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, recent classic. Be thorough, but at the same time, you know, be imaginative. It's at least, it, uh, when making a good decision, um, you know, there's often a tendency to focus on, you know, the rigour of the decision making, but it's at least as important to actually have good ideas about which to decide. And there's no recipe for having good ideas. Thinking about creative options. Uh, but, uh, but you need that. And so uh, all I'll say for the moment is, you know, try to be, be imaginative. At the same time, be critical, you know. Uh, if, if these sound like they're going in different directions, well, there's, there's you know, to some extent they are. And uh, at the end of the day, be decisive. Meaning, you know, make a decision. It sounds trivial, right? But uh, but you'll be faced with lots and lots of decisions to make. You need to be at, uh, to act fairly decisively in getting decisions done and out of the way, while at the same time being thorough and evidence-based. Right. So balancing those things is 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 a challenge. You know. But uh, so this, look, this is this is all. It's not motherhood statements exactly. It's, these are all you know useful insights. Well, sort of valid insights, I'll say. But but. But at the end of the day, how much difference will it make? Um, uh, what I'm going to do instead is tell you just what I did. Right? I'll just sort of by anecdote and demonstration, I'll show you, well, this is, this is how I went about it. This is what I found useful. Okay. Just before I do that, I'm going to make one more point about decision making. The kind of decision you make overwhelmingly will be what they call deliberative. That is, the decisions that you need to deliberate about. Now, deliberation is basically just weighing up the pros and the cons of the options you've got. The arguments and the evidence in relation to the options. Okay, deliberative decisions. You, you may not, may or may not have sort of, you know, uh, heard the term before, but you make decision, deliberative decisions all the time. Uh, the reason I say this is because there are other types of decisions that you also make, um, which you'll find that most of the time, uh, the important decisions you make as a, as a CEO are not those, right? So, so there's, um, 
let me just put this up. So deliberate decision is, is one where you say, well, we've got a problem here, what are we going to, or, or a challenge, what are we going to do? Well, identify, figure out what you could do, including variations. Think about the, uh, the advantages, disadvantages, pros and the cons. Uh, identify the arguments, the supporting evidence that bear upon whether those pros and cons are, are really any good or how, how good they are. And then having done all that, you know, weigh all that up. Now, of course, it doesn't necessarily happen in that that step-by-step -step fashion. You, you sort of go round and round to do this iterative, iteratively, but, but that's what um, essentially you know, deliberative decision-making is about. And it contrasts with, for example, um, intuitive, what I'll call intuitive or blink decision-making, uh, which you'll also do a lot of on, on less important decisions. This is the kind of si where you're in a situation, you go, oh yeah, well, yeah, we'll do that. Uh, you know, trivial decisions like, you know, where should we take the team, you know, where should we go for the weekly lunch, uh, you know, uh, through to, you know, technical decisions when you're actually involved in, in developing a product uh, where you, you size up a situation and bang, you just make a decision without barely even thinking of options, okay? Or somebody comes in and you instantly know, okay, that person, they, you know, that, they look like they know what they're talking about, for example. Uh, so uh, there are th th that's at one end. At the other end is what I'll call technical decisions. And those are decisions where you apply some kind of rigorous, gener generally quantitative framework to decision making. So this is um, multi-criteria decision making. This is decision analysis, you know, quantitative risk analysis, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? You, you've probably uh, experienced some of this or at least uh, heard of it. Um, this is basically where you need spreadsheets or other kinds of, you know, software tools to, to, uh, uh, to structure a complex decision in detail, add a whole lot of, num a whole lot of numbers and run algorithms and, and the decision is largely decided by the output of that, of that uh, you know, um, uh, new, that quantified process. And so um, there is a role for that. But I tell you, most of the time you won't be doing it. If, if, you, if you tried, you'd be totally bogged down uh, and you'd find a lot of decisions just don't fit. You know, it can't be kind of squeezed into one of these technical frameworks, right? So overwhelmingly, you are qualitatively weighing up options, arguments, pros and cons. And you're doing that, of course, with, you know, with others in a kind of a, a consultative process. Okay, so... Now these decisions can get quite complicated, even though you're doing it at a qualitative, deliberative kind of level. So there's a very, very basic truth about human thinking, uh, which is that if you can visualize, you can understand better. If, if there's some kind of complexity and you can see it, if you can see it laid out, then you can understand it better. Right? This is why we use you know, maps, Google Maps, you know, we use maps rather than verbal descriptions, for example, of the layout of a city. It'd be crazy to, to you know, if, uh, to get a phone book sized verbal description of all the streets in Melbourne. No, we actually have, uh, you know, visual uh, maps that use colour and space and lines and icons and all that sort of stuff. Okay. Fundamental truth, visualisation helps <coughs> our minds cope with complexity. That's the first point. The second point is decisions can be complex. So you can see where I'm going. You need, in my view, a useful visualization of the decision problem. Well, that's the kind of software that we were developing in our, in our uh, startup. And uh, the basic, what we call them is a decision map. It's not a very complicated idea. This is a basic decision map. Uh, in fact, this is, a, this is a real map of a real decision that we actually had to make in our company. Here was the problem. The problem was we had set up a company in the US. We had set up a US subsidiary. That was, of course, a strategic decision of its own. But anyway, we, that's what we've done. And then we realized, oh, uh, this company needs some money. You know, it has to pay some staff and it has to do some marketing and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it needs some money before it even has any revenues in the US. So, okay, let's give it some money. 
Well, how do you do that? As a matter of kind of legal technicality, I mean, you, you can't, yeah, sure, in some sense you can just wire money across, right, deposit it in the bank account, but how is that accounted for? What's the legal mechanism by which you've done that? It turns out that is itself one of those decisions that you need to understand, right? And, and there are two main, there are other possibilities, the two main possibilities is you can actually capitalise that, that company, basically buy shares in the company. Even though it's your subsidiary, you can actually sort of, you know, put money in it by, by capitalising it, or you can loan money to it. And each of these paths has pros and, you know, advantages and disadvantages. So you need to make a good decision here, you need to understand uh, those choices. And so, so a decision map says, okay, what's your question? What do you have to decide? What are your options? And possibly sub-options, although none are listed in this case. Okay, now, what can we find out by way of advantages or disadvantages, pros and cons? Uh, for example, the option of capitalising is, is tax-free, doesn't involve any taxes. But is that right? How do you know that? What's the argument for its being tax-free? You don't want to just jump to conclusions there, right? So, you, you know, we actually had a lawyer advising us on this and he said, well, it's, so, you know, there's a US and Australia corporate, there's actually a, a law that says it's tax-free. Uh, well, how do we know that? Well, actually, you can get more detailed evidence, you can actually find out what the law is, where it is, and so forth, okay? You see what I'm saying? It's not enough just to list pros and cons. You actually have to drill down and think about what are the arguments and counter-arguments and evidence and counter-evidence that would help you weigh up those pros, and con uh, those pros and cons. And believe me, when you've got a hierarchy of options and sub-options and each one has pros and cons, etc, etc, um, it can actually start to get quite complicated. And uh, now normally people think they can sort of hold all that stuff in their head and they can make, they can somehow weigh it up in their head. But it's, it's, one, it's again one of those illusions, you actually can't do it. And that's why people end up making decisions that actually ignore a lot of the relevant uh, reasoning uh, and evidence. They don't realise that's what's happening, but it is in fact what, what goes on. A decision map makes it harder to do that. Here's an example of a slightly more complex decision map. Um, this one is actually based upon a, a, a Harvard Business Review case study. Right, so if you look at that case study and you look at various responses to it and you try to map out what are the options that you could do in this circumstance and uh, I know you can't read this, that's alright. Um, and uh, what were the uh, pros and cons that, were, that people provided for the options that they preferred and etc. You know, lay it all out and it starts to look, now this is a medium complexity, it's not a really complex, but it's a medium complexity decision map. Okay, and, and the decisions you make as a CEO are very frequently going to have at least this level of complexity. And, it, and I just want to emphasise, you can't hold this in your head. Now this is a, uh, you know, you've just got a picture here, a static picture. If you want to create, manipulate these things, it actually takes quite a bit of work to develop these types of decision maps, much more than you, than you might have thought. But that amount of work that's required to draw up something as simple as this is a measure of the degree to which you understand or don't understand the decision that you've got. In other words, if you're very clear about what the decision problem is and what the relevant arguments and evidence are, then you can create this very quickly. But actually it takes more work than that because it turns out we're foggy. You know, we don't fully understand what are our options and how do they relate and, and so forth and, and where do these things, where does it all fit? Okay, so uh, what you want is, obviously if you're going to do this kind of thing, is a decent software package which is designed to help you do the job and of course that's what, what our company was developing. So I was in the curious position of being a decision maker, developing tools to help me make decisions. Right? And now I have to say at this stage, I have no commercial interest in this software. The IP was sold off to a Dutch company, so you know, I'm putting it up here because I'm telling you this is, how <laughs> this is what I did, uh, but I'm not, you know, whether you buy it or not makes no difference to me. Okay, so it's, I'm not trying to flog software, right? Uh, so, uh, so that's what we built. Um, it's out there. I think it's a mighty fine product myself. Uh, but uh, 
it does take a little bit of understanding as to you know uh, what it is, how it works. There's a bit of a bit of expertise involved in actually doing this stuff. Okay, uh, what I'll do is I'll just briefly illustrate. There is an online version of this, so it's drag and drop stuff. You know, it's a bit like Microsoft Visio if you've ever used that, uh, or you know. Uh, you're in, you're in some kind of situation, okay, we've got a US subsidiary, what's the question? Many questions could arise in relation to some, some situation that you're in, uh, but one question is, how do we transfer money? Oh, okay, well, one option is, uh, you know, we can do it by capitalizing, uh, and then, okay, what are the, uh, I'll just press, uh, press insert, um, if I can find it. Okay. Oh, yeah, it doesn't matter. The, uh, you get the idea, right? We can rapidly assemble and then modify these kinds of, of, uh, of diagrams and, and it has the right kind of concepts built into it and uh, pretty quickly you can build up a decision map. I call it a map because the word decision tree has a technical meaning. It's part of more technical decision analysis, right? You may have, some of you may have experienced decision, decision trees. This is not a quantitative decision tree. This is a higher level qualitative map of the decision problem you've got. It could be transformed into a decision, technical decision tree. Um, generally, we didn't do that. So, um, and now there's a whole lot of other uh, categories. Uh, the desktop version is much better, but um, it's a bit hard to um, see see all the stuff there. But the, the point is that there are different types of, of uh, judgments that you make, and different categories that are relevant to it. And uh, I won't go into all that now. Uh, one thing you can't see that's hidden away there is um, there's a kind of a compound uh, object which is suited to risks and benefits because you're constantly dealing with risks and you know, uncertain downsides and benefits that is uncertain upsides, right? And uh, <coughs> risks are compound things. There's what is the risk, how bad would it be if it happened, and how likely is it that it's going to happen? And each one of those has to be independently thought of and you need to bring evidence to bear. So uh, if you say, well, what if we um, hire you know, such and such you know, person as a, as a CEO of our, of our US you know, subsidiary, um, okay, but, um, but he had a previous uh, conviction for embezzlement. Um, does that really, you know, is that a risk? Is that a problem? Well, you can have some argument about that, right? You could. Uh, you, you might say, no, forget it, but then Another thing I'll tell you is, is one thing you don't realize is when you are hiring t to build your, your fabulous team in your startup, you actually have very limited options. Unless you're somehow stunningly successful, you actually, you put a job ads on Seek and so forth and, and you won't get a lot of high quality applicants. Right? Um, and, uh, and you don't have a whole lot of time to re-advertise, et cetera, et cetera, right? So sometimes you have to you have to compromise. You say, well, look, you know, I think we can manage. That means somehow taking risks. Maybe this person is going to turn out to be poison in our in our you know in our workspace. Maybe that's a risk. Well, you know, so so these th it's very useful to have these compound uh, objects. Like I can't illustrate it right now in this application, but I think you're getting the, the general flavor of this. So basically decision making for me meant um, every time I had a significant decision saying, okay, quickly map it out. What have we got here? And when you do that, remember that point about defensibility, you actually have a record of the thinking and the arguments and you can explain very easily why you made the decision that you made and that's important. Okay, So you build up a bit of an archive of documented thinking behind decisions. Okay. Now, it's also useful for collaboration, particularly for remote collaboration. Right, so you can put this up on a screen share and somebody in another state, another country, you can be talking with them, adding, adding nodes and, and, uh, 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 and collaboratively developing an understanding of the problem and the considerations uh, and, uh, and then that goes into a shared archive. Okay. So, uh, that's decision. Um, that's essentially decision mapping. It um, it enables you to um, 
to get clarity. Remember that picture I put up before, the guy with all this noise in his head? Well, that what decision mapping, it lets you sort of calm that down and get some kind of order into what you've got decisions and they break down into, you know, in certain ways and, uh, and you can start to get a, uh, a bit more of a handle on all the thinking you have to do. And um, I found this particularly useful when you'll find this as a CEO of a startup that, um, that people are constantly coming, knocking on your door and saying, ah, oh, you know, what are we going to do about this? And you go, well, what is this? And what's the problem? What's the issue here? And they go, oh, well, you know, so-and-so said this, and what about that, and that, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And it's just chaos, right? Somebody's just, you know, verbalizing all their thoughts about a decision problem. And you as a CEO have to listen to that and go, okay, let me get this straight. So the problem is this, you know, you've considered this option, but maybe you haven't considered that option, and why exactly do you think that's the right way to go? And have you thought about that? And, you know, you have to do all that in your head. And that is really laborious and you get sick of it, okay? So I would say to people, don't knock on my door and come and talk to me about a decision problem. First, I want to see the map. Send me the map. Say, I've got a decision. Here's my thinking that as best I could articulate it. And I go, okay. And I can look at that. I can survey it. I can scan it very quickly and easily and get, get much more with much less mental effort, get on top of what they think the decision problem is and, and possibly then add value or make a decision right, uh, to it. So it cut down the sheer amount of time that was spent talking through and trying to make sense of decisions by actually requiring as part of our decision culture within the, the startup uh, that this be a common practice, that people be, you know, be required to do it, to learn how to do it and to do it. Okay, and, and to store their maps where they could be easily accessed and get other people to have input on their maps and that sort of stuff. Okay. So this brings me to the last, I think, major point that I, I want to make, which is that uh, I think a very useful way to, to think of decisions is as projects. A decision, a major decision is a project. It has, a, it has a start date and has an end date and it has a certain amount of work and things have to happen and people have to be involved and you've got a whole series of these projects on at once and there's, I think, a very strong analogy with project management, being a project manager. And uh, I've, I'm very keen on the idea that um, you can make use of cloud-based project management, management solution type thing, or what I call more better term, cloud-based decision management systems that are analogous to cloud-based project management systems. And back in 2008, uh, I was sort of dreaming about going from this sort of desktop visualization tool that we had into building around that a cloud-based total decision management solution for an organization which had as its heart the visualization of deliberative decision making. Okay. Uh, well, we didn't get onto that project, um, other things happened, but um, a few years later I found out that a Melbourne company called Hexago, anybody know Hexago? Anybody uh, come across them? No? Uh, I don't know how they're doing, but I think they've got a really nicely developed uh, cloud-based decision management system. And I strongly recommend that you consider having a, d a, a decision management system as part of your your IT infrastructure. Okay, it'll it'll enable collaboration. It'll enable documentation. It'll reduce the stress. It'll help you prioritize. Okay, and Hexago is a pretty, I, I think, a pretty good uh, attempt at this. Although they don't take that extra step and use visualization. They don't use decision mapping. Uh, it'd be kind of nice if they had a good decision mapping tool built in, but but they don't, as far as I know. Okay. So uh, there, you know, there it is. That gives you a, a bit of an insight into what. Um, oh, there's a glimpse of Hexago, Hexago.com. Take a look at it. Uh, as I said, there's a certain amount of expertise involved in mapping out decisions properly, and really the only sort of decent guide to, to how to do it uh, that I know of, uh, not including the book that I've been trying to write for years, uh, is um, this 25-page uh, manual that you can download. Uh, from from that link, okay. 
So that tells you the fundamentals of how to map decisions. A lot of it is common sense, but, but, uh, but some of it isn't common sense. Some of, the sense you wouldn't, some of it is uh, unobvious, right? the principles of good mapping. But you get on top of it, it's like anything, get on top of that and uh, that'd be, I would say, one of the more useful things you could do for yourself as a decision maker. Given all the other problems you've got, the, the, the asymmetries and the cognitive biases and et cetera, et cetera, a lot of that stuff is unsolvable. Here is, there is at least something that I found useful, right, which is to uh, basically uh, exercise my skills in, in decision mapping. Okay. I'll leave it there. Uh, if anybody's got any thoughts, questions, happy to have a bit of discussion.